Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. Welcome. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Tory leader Pierre Polyev called Prime Minister Justin Trudeau a hypocrite when it comes to the federal carbon tax. Will the results from Monday night's by-elections in Manitoba and Quebec put more pressure on Trudeau to resign? Political reporter Brian Lilly will give his thoughts. And Alberta Grains is investing more than $4 million towards an initiative officials say will open the world to more Canadian agricultural exports. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says the carbon tax continues to hurt our economy. Polyev called Prime Minister Justin Trudeau a hypocrite and says the tax has cost Canadians billions of dollars. A carbon tax fraud has been perpetrated by this NDP Liberal Prime Minister who kept secret Environment Canada documents that showed that the carbon tax was blowing a $25 billion hole in our economy. Our economy per capita is smaller today than it was 10 years ago, during which time the American economy has grown by 19%. Instead of a reckless plan to hike the tax to 61 cents a litre, why not allow Canadians to vote to axe the tax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. News flash. When fire, forest fires hit communities across this country, it costs Canadians money. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister just proved my point. His tax doesn't stop floods, fires, or droughts. Yeah. All it does is create more poverty. This also from a high-flying, high-taxing, high-carbon hypocrite who flew 92,000 kilometers in a fuel-guzzling tax-funded private jet while he taxes single moms and seniors for heating their homes. Now, carbon tax Carney wants him to put the tax back on home heating oil. Will he reject Carmen Tax Carney and instead allow Canadians to choose to ax the tax? Two big by-elections were held on Monday night. In the Winnipeg riding of Elmo Transcona, the NDP took it with Leila Dance narrowly defeating the Conservative candidate Colin Reynolds. In the LaSalle, Emard, Verdun riding in Quebec, the Bloc's Louis Philippe Sauvé edged out the Liberal candidate Laura Palestini. The Montreal riding was former Liberal Justice Minister David Lametti's who walked away from public life. The Montreal riding was the second Liberal stronghold lost by the Trudeau government. The Liberals, as you may recall, also lost a Toronto area riding not that long ago. So what does all of this mean? Will Prime Minister Justin Trudeau step down now as party leader? I posed that question to Sun political columnist Brian Lilly. What? What? I'm sorry. I, I, I hear you talking. I, I can't hear you, Hal. I, that's kind of what Justin Trudeau is doing. He, he, he came out in front of the cameras this morning and, and talked about, you know, we, we just need to make sure that people are more engaged and we need to engage with them more. He was essentially saying, we need to talk to Canadians louder and longer. I don't think that is the message Canadians are sending you. Canadians are sending the message that they want change. And that includes him leaving as prime minister. The always colorful Sun political columnist Brian Lilly will also discuss how the name calling has increased as MPs return to Parliament Hill. We'll have details coming up in the second half of our program. Finance Minister Christian Freeland says Ottawa is making some changes to mortgage rules to help more Canadians purchase their first home. The changes are to take effect in December. We are raising the level for insured mortgages from 1 million to 1.5 million. The 1 million level was set in 2012. Since then, Canada's nominal GDP has increased by 65%. Uh, it was time to look at that number. And that is a change that is going to have a real impact for thousands, even millions of Canadians. It is going to put the dream of home ownership in reach for more young Canadians. The second change we're making in the insured market is we're saying that for all buyers of newly built homes in the insured space, 30-year amortizations will be available. Canada's inflation rate fell to 2% last month, finally hitting the Bank of Canada's target following a battle with skyrocketing price growth. As we hear in this next report now, that's the lowest level in more than three years and was led by lower gas and clothing prices. 
the Bank of Canada started raising interest rates in 2022 because inflation uh, was was rising well above its 2% target. Uh, and, you know, after those aggressive rate cuts, after some recovery from the pandemic globally, we finally hit that 2% benchmark. And so that's a big day uh, for the Bank of Canada, for Canadians, and for the economy. Uh, a major factor was uh, lower gasoline prices, down about 5% from, from last year. Uh, you saw month over month that uh, clothing and footwear prices actually fell, which is very uh, atypical. Retailers were giving those discounts uh, because the economy has been uh, quite weak and people have not been spending money. So another sign that things really are cooling in the economy and bringing inflation down. This is a you know an important moment. There's obviously an inflation print next month uh, that will play also a significant role in the Bank of Canada's rate decision uh, later in October. And if we see another uh, print around 2% or even lower, uh, that really will raise alarm bells uh, for the Bank of Canada and for economists uh, in favor of larger rate cuts. Grocery prices, meanwhile, rose 2.4% in August compared to 2023. Stats Canada says that is a far cry from their peak of 11.4% in late 2022 and earlier last year. Canadians struggling with high food prices may have noticed the costs for meat, dairy products, fruit and vegetables were slightly higher last month. Prices for processed meat and coffee, meanwhile, declined slightly. The folks with Alberta Grains are pitching in with just over $4.3 million towards the Global Agriculture Technology Exchange, otherwise known as the GATE Initiative. Officials say it's part of a broader $13.2 million collaboration to create a state-of-the-art facility that will serve as a hub for market access, development and innovation within Canada's cereal sector. Experts say this should enhance Canada's standing as a global leader in agricultural exports. Alberta Grains Region 6 Director Greg Sears says producers really need to jump on board. I think this is a call to action for uh, our producers to take ownership of, of the marketing and the market support for the products that we produce. Um, you know, Alberta Grains has been able to uh, provide assurance to Cereals Canada uh, with, with funding uh, as a... Uh, as a building block and to, to gain partnerships from others in the industry and from government. And, uh, you know, I think farmers should be jumping in on supporting this project wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, nobody benefits more from maintaining premium prices and market access than we do as producers. And uh, so I think it's, it's a great thing that we need to support wholeheartedly. Sears adds the total cost of the project will be around $102 million, including the building and specialized equipment. He says they're also hoping for some government funding. As for the $13.2 million, it will also include collaboration funding by Sasquheat and the Manitoba Crop Alliance. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is going to announce help for school classrooms facing capacity issues. Even with the Alberta's calling campaign, Smith says her government was really surprised at the number of people who moved to our province last year. She says schools are being squeezed by the huge influx of students. Alberta's population increased by more than 200,000 from 2023 to this year. Well, we had a severe thunderstorm watch earlier today here in Lethbridge. We experienced quite a bit of rain. Jeanette Roche is now with an early look at the forecast. Jeanette, how long will the rain clouds be hanging around? Well, right into Wednesday at this point, Hal, uh, we are seeing the risk of thunderstorms as well lasting through the evening past midnight, right around 2 o'clock in the morning. That's when that should end. Also, the 60% chance of showers we saw today, that should last through the night into early tomorrow morning on Wednesday. We're seeing about a 30% chance around 6 a.m., and then that should last throughout most of the day on Wednesday. But the bright spot, high of 22 degrees, so that should take us a bit higher than our seasonal average, which is a little bit higher than today and I'll be back later in the show with a full look at the national forecast. Great thanks so much Jeanette. As Israel continues to battle Hamas in the Gaza Strip comes word that the Israel Defense Forces is getting ready for a war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. According to TBN Israel correspondent Yer Pinto, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is telling his military to expand its war efforts against various terrorist groups. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the IDF to prepare for a wide campaign in Lebanon 
telling the high command that the situation cannot continue while commando raids and airstrikes on Hezbollah positions have already begun in earnest. Air raid alarms sounded in central Israel on Sunday morning as a surface-to-surface -surface missile was launched from Yemen falling in an open area near the city of Lod. Last week also saw intense operations in the Gaza Strip, including permission for the publication of a recording Hamas made of one of Israel's hostages, which is the first sign of life his family has ever seen from him in almost one year. All of this is happening as the world watches with increasing concern as Iran inches ever closer to the ability to build a nuclear weapon. Former Canadian Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson has been found not guilty of sexual assault and an indecent act in a case that dates back to 1991. Lawyer Brian Greenspan says his client feels vindicated. The complainant says she found some healing throughout the judicial process. Retired Vice Admiral Edmondson is gratified by what can only be described as a clear, decisive vindication of his steadfast position that he was not guilty of these false accusations. The trial judge's reasons were clear, the complainant's account was unreliable, and the time verged on he called the fantastical, indeed almost unbelievable. By contrast, the trial judge described by Admiral Edmondson's evidence as helpful, logical, articulate, and reliable. Unfortunately today, Justice Weber delivered a reasonable doubt verdict. That was hard for me to hear, but I don't regret bringing this complaint forward. I told the truth and I stand strong knowing that all of this was not done in vain. One thing I learned is that we have a lot of work to do to restore balance in the justice system and for the support of victims. The Alberta government says the infusion of more sheriffs is helping to get more criminals off the street. They say the $2.6 million investment it made earlier this year has really helped to remove more than 300 wanted offenders since February. The province created the Fugitive Apprehension Sheriff Support Team to help police find and arrest high-priority fugitives. Officials say of the 303 arrests that have been made, 260 were considered the most dangerous and prolific offenders in the province. In just seven months, uh, the team has executed more than 1,300 warrants. Now, that may seem like a large number, but there are more than 82,000 warrants that are active in the province of, Alberta, uh, province of Alberta at this time. So, what does that mean in regards to 1,300 warrants? Well, that means that more than 300 offenders have been apprehended, taken into custody, and are now off the streets. The sheriff's group consists of 14 members, including 12 sheriffs and two supervisors. The teams are based in Calgary and Edmonton. The three men who were found dead in a home in Lloydminster last Wednesday have been identified by police. 66-year-old Brent Peters and his two sons, 34-year-old Brennan and 32-year-old Matthew, were found by RCMP after responding to a wellness check on the property back on September the 11th. Police determined that the three were targeted in an isolated incident. So far, no suspects have been arrested. Little details have since been released, but RCMP are asking anyone with information to help with their investigation to call Crime Stoppers right away at 1-800-222-8477. Lethbridge police have charged two 16-year-old males with arson in connection with a business fire earlier this month. The two youths, who cannot be named under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, are each charged with arson to property and disregard for human life. Emergency crews responded to a blaze back on September the 1st at a business located along the 1500 block of 2nd Avenue South. Crews extinguished the fire, but damage exceeded a half a million dollars. Video surveillance captured the suspects and police revealed several tips from the public to identify and arrest them. A third suspect was identified and determined to be a witness and is not facing any charges. September is World Suicide Prevention Month. Now, suicide impacts people of all ages and backgrounds here in our country. According to Stats Canada, each year, more than 4,000 people in Canada commit suicide, which is equivalent to 12 people dying each and every day. The Mental Health Services team lead with the University of Lethbridge, Brian Bullock, explains what leads them to try and take their own lives and what mental health supports are available. It's this lack of choice or, you know, just this stuckness potentially. But then again, not everyone goes 
to thoughts of suicide. There is a fair amount of supports out there. So I would say in that regard, like whether that's the hospital, going to emergency room, the crisis intervention team, or, you know, someone's just needing support and somewhere safe to be, that's the, that could be the crisis beds. There's private counseling options. There's community agencies as well. So there's some free or subsidized counseling options. We always make those efforts. I think those are more of those preventative efforts that that are continually made, whether that's health promotion, whether that's just awareness, whether that's resilience. Then the other thing I always think of is just building up our suicide safer communities. So I just think the more knowledgeable, the more comfortable we as a group, as a society can become just talking about it, supporting it. Some of those natural supports, whether that's spiritual leaders, religious leaders, family, friends, neighbors. According to Stats Canada, each day more than 200 people in Canada attempt suicide. The research also says the risk for suicide is mostly in men and boys and people serving federal sentences. Women have higher rates of self-harm. Experts say self-harm can be a risk factor for suicide as well. The city of Lethbridge has determined that they will remove two well-known peace shrines in the city's River Valley due to environmental concerns. The decision comes as ecologists say various plant species are being threatened along with invasive plants which are now in the area. Officials say visitors also tend to leave garbage behind such as plastic and metals which ecologists say could enter the river and harm the wildlife around it. The shrines also violate a city bylaw despite it standing for several years. We do want to recognize the effort that went into these shrines. Um, someone put a lot of effort and passion into these and these are truly impressive displays. We also recognize that some members of the community may not appreciate the takedown of these shrines. Um, however, as stewards of the land, we have a responsibility to take care of the environment. And after consultation with environmental experts, these shrines pose some environmental uh, con concerns that we have, uh, particularly the, um, the damage to several local plant species. Um, there's exposed bare ground, which is leading into opportunity for more invasive weeds to take control of the area and um, there's lots of debris being left behind which is actually poses a risk to local wildlife and could potentially enter the waterways. City officials say the shrines were made as a sacred gathering space for people of all different faiths and spiritualities including the local blood tribe and is made to look like a labyrinth. Removal of the shrines has already begun with reclamation of the land to immediately follow. Well, we had lots of rain clouds and fairly cool here today in Lethbridge. Will the moisture be sticking around? A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Well, it was a soggy day for the most part here in Lethbridge today. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, the rain also brought us some much cooler temperatures as well. Well, it did, and I don't even think we hit our daytime high today of 19 degrees. It did uh, feel relatively cool throughout the day, but we are going to get there tomorrow. In fact, we're going to get a little higher than seasonal, so uh, we are seeing that 60% chance of showers lasting through the evening, 30% chance on Wednesday with that high of 22, and then clear skies for Thursday, high of 23 degrees, and then we get back into those teen temperatures uh, for Friday, high of 14 degrees. 16 for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, which is still a little lower than seasonal, but still within that range. So average high for this time of year, 19. Average low, 5 degrees. Uh, we saw our record high of 32 degrees on this day, happening back in 1981. And in 1965, we had the record low on this day, which was minus 2. 7-Eleven, there you go, slurpy time. That's when the sun rose this morning. Sunset this evening at 7.38. Uh, so we're actually 9 minutes less light, less daylight than we saw yesterday. Uh, unbelievable. I don't know what's going on. I feel like it's happening so fast. I don't remember it happening this fast in the spring and summer going the other way. I think it's faster, getting darker. 18 tomorrow in Victoria. We're seeing a little bit cooler, 14 with the onshore winds. 18 as well in Vancouver tomorrow with mainly cloudy overcast skies clear skies though in most of Alberta tomorrow. Edmonton sitting at 22, 21 for the high in Calgary. As we get into the rest of the prairies, we are seeing uh, more risks of uh, thunderstorms and also could see some showers. So 20 for the high in Saskatoon, uh, seeing 10 millimeters of rain with that risk of thunderstorm. Uh, Regina is seeing a 60% chance of showers, 23 for the high, 25 in Winnipeg with a 30% chance of showers and a risk of thunderstorms there. So 
as we get into central Canada, we're seeing more clear skies, more sunshine, more warm weather as well, and some fairly high humidexes. High humidex is up into the low 30s, high 26 in Toronto, clear skies 28 for the high in Ottawa. And same thing for Montreal with mostly mainly close sunny skies there, not as many clouds. As we get into Fredericton, seeing a humidex of 35, high of 30 degrees. Look at that, sunshine there in Fredericton. Halifax sitting at 27, 26 for the high in Charlottetown and a high of 21 degrees in St. John's. Could see a 40% chance of showers up until noon and then mainly overcast skies for the rest of the day. So there you have it, that is your forecast. After many months of sky-high levels, Canada's inflation rate fell to 2% last month. The August Consumer Price Index reading is down from 2.5% in July and at the lowest level since February of 2021. Stats Canada attributed the slowdown in part to lower gasoline prices. Clothing and footwear also decreased month over month, marking the first August decline since 1971 as retailers offered larger discounts to entice shoppers amid slowing demand. The report is expected to spark more speculation that the Bank of Canada may cut its key lending rate again next month. It currently sits at 4.25%. Even though inflation has dropped to 2%, many people here in southern Alberta are looking for ways to deal with the high cost of living. And here in our city in Lethbridge, the unemployment levels have decreased to 4.9%. According to Trevor Lewington, CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, job vacancies are decreasing in our city, but labour shortage is still a bit of an issue in some sectors. We've got a master job board that compiles all of the different job postings from the whole region. And just this morning, there were almost 1,400 positions posted. So there are definitely opportunities out there. And where we're seeing the, you know, so the demand is all the same story as it's been before. Class one drivers continues to be an urgent need. Skilled trades, always a concern. And in particular of late, we've seen a, an increased need both in food service, so restaurants, and hospitality as well as retail. So there's there's opportunities both in the end those sort of sort of traditional entry level positions as well as skilled trades and equipment operators. Good to see there's some opportunities. Make sure you catch the full interview with Trevor Lewington, CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge and BCN's Jeanette Roche coming up later in our show. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 24 basis points to 23,677. The Dow was also down 15 points to 41,606. The S&P 500 was up 1.5 points to 5,634. And the Nasdaq was also up 35 points to 17,628. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up a buck or two to $71.11 US per barrel. Natural gas was down six cents to two dollars thirty-one cents U.S. Gold was down five bucks forty cents to two thousand five hundred and seventy-five dollars U.S. an ounce, and silver was down eight cents to thirty dollars sixty-eight cents U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at seven dollars eighty-one cents per bushel. Barley is at six dollars fourteen cents. Canola is at twelve ninety-five, and corn is at seven dollars thirty-nine cents per bushel. Live cattle October contract was down a buck thirty to one eighty three fifteen. Feeder cattle September contract was up two bucks to two forty three thirty, and Lean Hawks October contract was up a buck eighty five to eighty one dollars and seventy eight cents. And the Canadian dollar was slightly up over the past twenty four hours and currently sits at seventy three sixty U S. Recapping one of our top stories, Alberta Grains is pitching in with just over $4.3 million towards the Global Agriculture Technology Exchange, otherwise known as the GATE Initiative. Spokesperson Greg Sears says as part of a broader $13.2 million collaboration to help create a state-of-the-art $102 million facility that will serve as a hub access for markets, development and innovation within Canada's cereal sector. He says the $13.2 million collaboration also includes funding by Sasquit and the Manitoba Crop Alliance. You know, with the Liberals losing in two recent by-elections, could that mean the end of Justin Trudeau's leadership? Sun political columnist Brian Lilly will offer up his thoughts on that subject in just a moment. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews.
A couple of big by-elections took place on Monday. The one in Winnipeg was won by the NDP, and the one in Montreal, the riding there, was taken by the Bloc Québécois. Now to chat about this in more detail, and what it may mean for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is political columnist with the Toronto Sun, Brian Lilly, joining us once again from the big smoke. Now, Brian, Leila Dance of the NDP took the Elmwood Transcona riding in Manitoba, narrowly beating the Tory candidate, Colin Reynolds, and the Verdun riding was taken by Louis Philippe Sauvé, beating the Liberal candidate, Laura Palestini. Now, the Montreal riding was a Liberal stronghold that was former Justice Minister David Lametti's riding. In your opinion, what should we make out of all of this? My general take on by-elections is mostly they don't matter at all until they do. And these two by-elections matter a great deal. Like the one in Toronto St. Paul's, where the Conservatives stole it back in June, that's a big deal. That was a riding that it was uh, about 40 years since the Conservatives had won that riding. Um, and then in these two, you've, as you mentioned, the, the riding of LaSalle and Mark Verdun, uh, David Lametti held it until recently. He was Justin Trudeau's justice minister until Trudeau unceremoniously dropped him. And Lametti said, all right, I'm out of here. Uh, so a bit of a, a, a self-inflicted wound by Trudeau. He lost a cabinet minister, loses the by-election, loses a seat. This is also the writing that Paul Martin, when he was prime minister and finance minister under Jean Chrétien, he represented this area. So for the liberals to lose it is a big deal. In the last uh, election, they took just over 40% of the popular vote in that riding. They dropped 15 points to 27. Every other party saw their vote increase. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, look how bad the Conservatives did. They only got 11.6%. Well, the last election, they only got 745 So that was a big increase for them. Still bad, and I never expect them to do well in this riding. But the Bloc and the NDP were challenging. I was watching the numbers roll in until the wee hours, and it was rolling over like a speedometer every you know few updates. Uh, at various points, the NDP, the Liberals, and the Bloc were all in the lead. In the end, the Bloc comes out victorious. Elmwood Transcona, that was important not for the Liberals at all. They were not players in this. But for the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, since he wrote, ripped up the coalition deal, has been trying to say that, look, uh, I'm the only person that can take on Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives. I'm the only one that can stand up to him. He couldn't afford to lose that by-election if that's his messaging, if he had lost, if Colin Reynolds had taken that for the Conservatives, wow, you know, J uh, Jagmeet Singh would have no argument going forward. So he won. That's good for him and his party. Uh, but you know, part of the reason, you know, talking to New Democrats, part of the reason that they ripped up the agreement when they did is the anger they were hearing at the door in Winnipeg from voters saying, we don't like it. You're too close to the Liberals. By the way, what happened to the Liberal vote in Elmwood, Transcona? it collapsed as well. So it collapsed in Verdun, it collapsed in Elmwood, Transcona. It went from 15% last election to under 5% this election. And it looks like everybody else, you know, whether it was PPC or Greens, you know, the, everybody went to the Conservatives, not the New Democrats. The New Democrats held where they were last election. The Conservatives jumped up from 28 to 44%. So Brian, the Liberals lost the Verdun riding. They lost the Trudeau area riding recently. Do you think Justin Trudeau will finally see the writing on the wall and perhaps step down? Will he receive even more pressure from party members to step aside? What? What? I'm sorry. I, I, I hear you talking. I, I can't hear you, Hal. Uh, that's kind of what Justin Trudeau is doing. He, he, he came out in front of the cameras this morning and, and talked about, you know, we, we just need to make sure that people are more engaged and we need to engage with them more. He was essentially saying, we need to talk to Canadians louder and longer. I don't think that is the message Canadians are sending you. Canadians are sending the message that they want change. And that includes him leaving as prime minister. We had the Montreal area MP, uh, Alexander Mendez, coming out and saying, look, I still like him, but I heard clearly from my constituents, they don't want him as leader anymore. They don't want him as prime minister. He's not getting it. I don't know if you saw this, but there was reporting in the Toronto Star over the weekend. If it wasn't in the Star, I would think this was satire. People were making stuff up to ridic ridicule Trudeau. But it's from a well-connected uh, reporter, lots of insights into the Liberal caucus and cabinet. And Trudeau was playing clips of Rocky and the inspirational speech that Al Pacino gives on uh, in the movie Any Given Sunday about coming back. 
as Pierre Polyev said on uh, the weekend, Trudeau thinks he's the star of every movie and he's the underdog, the little guy, even though he was born on third base with a silver spoon in his mouth. Um, you know, Trudeau is determined to stick around. He is determined to fight Polyev and he will stick it out as long as he can. He was making nice noises about the block and the NDP when the House resumed on Monday, saying he understands them and, and they want what's right for Canadians, not like those Conservatives who don't care about Canadians. Now, Brian Jagmeet Singh says he's the only leader who can stand between Canadians and Conservative cuts. Now, many would argue the biggest cut that Pierre Polyev is going to make is to the carbon tax, axe the tax. Is Singh Polyev's biggest competition leading up to 2025? No, I don't think so. Whether we go uh, this fall, this you know coming spring, or in October 2025, I don't think so. Jagmeet Singh has not resonated with voters at all. Um, NDP fundraising is weak at best. Their polling puts them below where they've been performing in the last few elections. Uh, you know, th there are New Democrats and supporters of th that party questioning whether he should go. If he had lost that by-election last night, there would be calls for his head today. He had to rip up the agreement to show that he wasn't in Justin Trudeau's pocket to try and save the furniture in a riding that the NDP have won now 11 of the last 12 elections. They've won that riding. So, you know, for the Conservatives to come that close is a threat to the NDP, and they know it. If they hadn't ripped up that confidence uh, in supply agreement, the coalition deal, very well the Conservatives might have taken it because New Democrat supporters might have said, I'm staying home. Now, we, you know, Jagmeet Singh has to worry about confidence votes and what's he going to do? Will he vote with the government? That's going to be a difficult uh, issue for him to to follow, denouncing them constantly and then voting with them will not look good to these same people who are upset in, in Winnipeg. Brian, Liberal House Leader Karina Gould just got back from maternity leave. She showed up in the House of Commons calling Pierre Polyev a fraudster. Now, where did that come from? Uh, Polyev, uh, you know, gave a speech uh, to his caucus on Sunday. You know, all the parties have their caucuses meet before the return of Parliament. Uh, the New Democrats went to Montreal trying to rally the troops for the by-election there, partly, I think. And, of course, the, uh, the Trudeau cabinet flew to Halifax, and then the whole Liberal caucus went to Nanaimo. They, you know, they love racking up the, uh, uh, the carbon footprint. So Polyev gives this speech to the Conservative caucus Sunday morning in Ottawa and, and says the same thing he said to me in the interview I did with him that aired on Sunday – he said, Trudeau's carbon tax will result in a nuclear winter for Canadian industry. And he backs it up. You know, my conversation with him, I put things to him. He backs it up with fact of what's happening. He points to the report from the Canadian Truckers Alliance. Uh, the fact that something like cement is going to double in price under the carbon tax because the carbon tax will more than double what it costs to make a ton of cement. So all of these things are there. But he calls it a nuclear winter, says it'll be bad. Based on that, Karina Gold calls him a fraudster. Then she stands up in the House of Commons and bemoans people name-calling when they start referring to Mark Carney as carbon tax Carney. Karina Gold is one of the most partisan, lecturing, hectoring MPs going. She does it with a smile. She's very smiley. She seems very pleasant. But she is one of the most partisan MPs going. She's probably going to lose her, uh, her riding in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, between Toronto and Hamilton. It's a you know, well-to-do suburban area, flips between conservatives and liberals. But yeah, she was, I couldn't, as my mother would say, she's got quite the brass neck, standing there and calling people names and then decrying people calling other people names. It's, uh, it, it, and, and then she says, you, you know, defends the CBC saying, well, we've got to protect CBC because of all the misinformation out there. By the way, she lied about every single one of uh, Polyev's positions uh, ascribing to him things that, you know, he's never said. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the nicknames. It seems like Gould's not the only one that's taking issue with it. Uh, like you said, Carbon Tax Carney and the Phantom Finance Minister. Liberals are calling these names, what, Trumpian? Yeah, it, it, these nicknames could stick and they could work. Uh, they could also turn some people off, especially women voters. Uh, men are much more comfortable with aggressive politics and aggressive posturing than women. And I know some viewers watching might say, oh, why are you being stereotypical? Well, stereotypes do exist for a reason. And 
the public opinion polling would back that up. So Pierre has to walk a, a, a very fine line between being aggressive and doing things like nicknames and not turning off swing voters. Swing voters win every election, right? You know, the parties are trying to win the swing voters so they can win, win the election. You've got to have those swing voters on side. And women in the suburbs of Toronto and Vancouver, big part of the group that's going to decide the election. Right now, they're on Polyev's team in droves. Uh, it used to be that uh, the conservatives just had a big gender gap when it came to men. Well, now there's a big gender gap between the number of women supporting the conservatives and the women supporting the liberals. The liberals only have women over the age of 55, mostly who are retired civil servants. Uh, that's that's their basic base now, and uh, it's why they're doing so badly in the polls. Abacus had them down at 22% support nationally, 25% in Ontario. Those numbers are wipeout numbers. Brian, let's also talk a bit about this uh, dust-up between the Conservatives and the Liberals over satellites and billionaire Elon Musk. What happened there? Last Friday, uh, Justin Trudeau went to Montreal and he announced $2.14 billion as a loan for Telesat. Now, Telesat was started in 1969 by the federal government, it was a crown corporation until the 90s, sold off by the Chrétien Liberals to Bell, then it was sold off to an American company, and in 2021, they had an IPO. They're a publicly traded company now, and their big shareholders are in New York and Chicago. Um, but you know, they still have a lot of workers in Canada, and they want to launch low Earth orbit satellites. It's a project called Lightspeed. Uh, they've already got 198 of them up in space, and they want to launch more to provide home internet services and business internet services in rural and remote areas. There's also a component, a small part of this, that would be upgrading uh, capabilities for NORAD and NATO. But that's a small part. And, and the government didn't play that up. They played up, we are giving uh, home internet to rural and remote areas. So Michael Barrett, conservative MP from just outside Ottawa, he tweeted at Elon Musk, how much would it cost for you to do this using Starlink? And he replied, half that price. Well, the liberals freaked out and said, oh, look, they'd rather give money to American billionaires, to foreign billionaires. Wait, last time I checked, Elon Musk, Canadian. Used to have a Canadian passport. I understand he doesn't travel on one now. But a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Oh, unless you're a successful business person in America that has different political views. So that's kind of the dust up. Uh, the, the liberals initially said, their argument was this is about jobs in Quebec. When they realized that looked bad, they try and switched it to defense. There's an argument to be made for having sovereignty on matters of defense communications, but the majority of the light speed project by Telesat is about home and, and business internet. When the government gave them $1.4 billion three years ago to do this project, which still isn't off the ground properly, they said it would connect 40,000 homes. 40,000 homes. That's it, Hal. Starlink has 400,000 customers in Canada already, and they started after Telesat. And Telesat is going to use Starlink's parent company, SpaceX, also owned by Elon Musk, to launch the rest of their satellites. I want good homegrown jobs and in industries in Canada. It's important. But obviously, Telesat is not you know, building the better mousetrap. Brian, the public inquiry into foreign interference will not give us the names of the 11 federal candidates who allegedly received funds and assistance from China. What was the reasoning behind this? Uh, they cite privacy. They cite uh, the need to not prosecute people in the court of public opinion. Uh, my argument, Hal, is we still need to know more. Uh, we've known about this for a couple of years now. We've had a public inquiry, and all Canadians are being told is, no, you know, you, you don't need to know anything. You just know that we're looking after it. So we don't know the candidates. We don't know the political operatives in the background that we're doing this. We, I, there's one Chinese diplomat that we didn't even uh, expel. They left of their own volition months after their name was revealed as being part of this. Compare that to the United States. There have been two incidents recently one involving Chinese interference in the American affairs, one involving Russian interference in American affairs. There are charges in both. The former chief, uh, deputy chief of staff to 
the governor of New York, two governors. They, she worked for both Andrew Cuomo and then for Kathy Hochul after Cuomo stepped down, charged with acting as a foreign agent, money laundering, all kinds of other charges. Her husband charged as well. In the Russia case, two employees of Russia Today charged with trying to spread influence, being foreign agents of Russia, money laundering. These people are facing serious criminal prosecution. And in Canada, we're patted on the head and told, no, don't worry about it. Now, I understand that some of the MPs may not even know that they were being targeted by this. Just like in the RT case, there are a number of well-known American conservatives who were in that. But even the uh, Democrat Attorney General, Merrick Garland, said these guys didn't know that this plot was going on underneath them. They were detached from it. That may be the case with the MPs. We still deserve to know who's being targeted, how they're being targeted, who is doing the targeting. Not this, you know, let's just pretend everything's good. And then, of course, the liberal talking point is, well, Pierre Polyev could find out if he would just get a security clearance. Well, okay, but then what could he do with it? Absolutely nothing. If he found out that he had a gaggle of his MPs who were actually agents of China, and he acted on that, he'd be in violation of the secrecy laws of Canada. The, the, the only way for this to, to have real action is for the government to release the information. Swearing uh, Polyev to a secret uh, secrecy uh, clause and, and then showing him what's going on won't solve anything. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today from Toronto. Thank you, Hal. Hard to believe that fall is here already. So how are things looking on the economic front for Lethbridge and Southern Alberta? Well, joining me to dive into this is Trevor Lewington, CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge. Trevor, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you with us again today. Thanks for having me once again. Appreciate it. Of course. So, Trevor, what is the overall economic trend right now for Southern Alberta? How are we looking? Yeah, we've seen some very positive gains in employment over this year. So I think that's a positive sign. Uh, we've seen, you know, some indications, especially this week, inflation easing down to the sort of target of 2%. So that's good news. Hopefully that prompts the Bank of Canada to continue lowering interest rates, which could be a good boost to the economy. And it's September. So that means, of course, students are back in both at the university and the polytechnic. And it's great to see stores and restaurants full of students as they return to town and bring sort of that energy and vibrancy back to our local economy. And frankly, the ag sector as well. In the very beginning of the year, when we talked last, I think there was some concerns, of course, about the impact of potential drought and the impact it might have on the harvest. And so far, so good. Things seem to be holding steady in the agri-food sector as well. So overall, things are sounding pretty good out there. Yeah, it looks very positive, that's for sure. So where are our unemployment levels at this point? Yeah, unemployment in Lethbridge as of last month was a low of 4.9% actually, and that's the lowest rate of all the large urban areas all across the Prairie Provinces. If you think about Calgary, for example, at 7.5% and Edmonton higher still at 8.6%, our 4.9% definitely stands out. So that's good news. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a job, it is a very tight labour market. It's definitely a job seekers market. Uh, we saw gains, for example, last month in culture and recreation. We gained about 700 jobs there. There were gains in wholesale and retail trade as well. And over the last year, we've actually seen the labor force in Lethbridge grow by almost 14,000 jobs. So there's very significant job growth over the last 12 months, which is very encouraging. That is super encouraging. Okay, so what about small businesses? Are we seeing a decrease or an increase in business startups? Yeah, great question. I mean, the number of active businesses in Alberta, so the province as a whole over the first five months or so of the year, was actually up 1.3%. And that doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but that's actually the highest increase across all the Canadian provinces. So 1.3 boost in the total number of active jobs is actually a good number. And we don't have any specific data to Lethbridge for this year just yet. But when we look at all of 2023, local business counts in Lethbridge were up almost 3%, so double that provincial number. So if that trend continued into this year, we're in very good shape in the small business space as well. 
Yeah, okay, so how are these businesses faring now with the challenge of finding workers to fill job vacancies? Are there any particular sectors that are seeing more labor shortages than others? Yeah, and there, therein lies the challenge, right? So good news is we have a very strong employment situation. Bad news is employers are still struggling finding that talent. Now, it has improved. So when, if we would have talked a couple of years ago, just coming out of the COVID pandemic, in our region, there were about 6,500 job vacancies. And now that number is closer to 4,000. That's still a lot of vacancies, but certainly an improvement for employers. It's been a little bit easier to find the talent they need. I did, for example, look, we've got a master job board that compiles all of the different job postings from the whole region. And just this morning, there were almost 1,400 positions posted. So there are definitely opportunities out there. And where we're seeing the, you know, so the demand is all the same story as it's been before. Class one drivers continues to be an urgent need. Skilled trades, always a concern. And in particular of late, we've seen a, an increased need both in food service, so restaurants, and hospitality as well as retail. So there's there's opportunities both in the end those sort of sort of traditional entry level positions as well as skilled trades and equipment operators. Okay. Well, everything is sounding somewhat optimistic so far. So what are you hearing from business owners? Are they apprehensive going into the fall Christmas season or are they feeling optimistic? Yeah, I, I do think there's still some challenges ahead in terms of affordability. Everybody is struggling with the impact of inflation over the last number of years and Although inflation has slowed to 2%, that doesn't mean prices are going down. They're still going up. They're just going up less. So, you know, I do think that will potentially influence uh, consumer spending this, this fall as we roll into the Christmas season. People are still very conscious that life is more expensive across so many things. The other challenge we have coming into Christmas this year is the Canadian dollar continues to underperform, which means all those imports are more expensive than they might have been last year. And so, that's a challenge. It'll hopefully prompt people to spend more at local shops, buying local goods and boosting the local economy. The other thing that I think has businesses concerned is although interest rates have come down, consumer debt levels have never been higher in this country. And so there's an enormous pressure for people to pay interest and manage those debts. And I think it may prompt some people to forego some of the Christmas luxuries and maybe focus on uh, their, their debt payments and worry about that. So we could see an impact for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because you mentioned um, it's back to school time, and of course that always boosts the economy a little bit. So we probably saw a lot of people uh, buying back to school clothes and supplies like we usually see. Did you notice any kind of a difference this year? You're, we're talking about Christmas, sort of comparing the two in terms of the inflation rate and just how people are struggling right now with debt. Did you notice any difference going into that back to school season? Yeah, I haven't heard any stories locally. Uh, you know, it's a little too early to tell from a statistics perspective. Mm -hmm. There's always a lag on when we can get the data to see what September really looked like. Right. Uh, I know a number of school divisions uh, this year implemented programs where parents no longer had to buy their own supplies. The school provided a set list. So I think, you know, even the education space, typically some of that shopping, is people are thinking differently about how to maybe approach it in another way that perhaps saves parents some money. So it'll be, it will be interesting to see when those numbers roll in. Very interesting indeed. Okay, so up the top there, you did, you did mention uh, the agriculture. So what kind of, um, you, you know, feedback are you getting from the agribusiness sector at this point? Yeah, it, you know, this is, again, the largest sector for the local economy. Agri-food and agribusiness drives southern Alberta, so it is, it is critical for us. Uh, we have seen pretty strong commodity and cattle prices, for example, over this year. Prices have held steady, and cattle, in fact, has increased, driving some people to uh, sell and, and make some money on their herds. Uh, as I mentioned at the, off, off the top of the show, you know, we're very fortunate in that the drought we were anticipating did not materialize. Still some concern, of course, about the levels of moisture going into next year, but certainly nothing like what we thought could have happened, sort of the worst case scenarios. So that has, in fact, it, you know, helped uh, crop yields, allowed producers to get, uh, you know, generally their regular income that they would have seen. We avoided that debt crunch. But locally, we've also seen significant investments. So McCain Foods, you know, their $600 million expansion in Lethbridge County, doubling the size of production will drive potato consumption for years to come uh, and, and the need for more potato acres. And then the, you know, the investment by New Cold and Coaldale to build a $220 million 
uh, frozen storage and distribution facility. These are big construction projects that will drive you know, jobs in the short term in the construction sector, but also long term as they're staffed and uh, that they continue to grow. So that's, that, again, the whole, the whole sector seems to be performing well at this point. Okay, great. Now, how about the surrounding Southern Alberta communities? How are they doing economically? Anything of note happening there? That would be the, the smaller towns and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, those two big projects along Canada's premier food corridor along Highway 3, of course, are helping provide spin-off benefits to all of the communities along that corridor. Uh, we have seen in Fort McLeod a major expansion by structural trusts. Anyone that's driving along Highway 3 will have seen the big buildings going up along the highway. So that's been an exciting development in that region. And uh, interestingly enough, this, the town of Tabor is celebrating their 120th anniversary next year. And as a part of that discussion, they're, they're sort of debating whether or not to become a city and whether or not changing their name and sort of going after a different branding makes some sense. So it's, again, I think it speaks to the region. We've seen a number of communities grow over the last year. Our whole region grows quite well relative to the rest of the country. And we may actually have another city on the map uh, very close to us yeah, soon. Yeah, and it, it could be the corn capital of Canada. Who knows, right? We, we all love the Tabor corn. They're famous for it. So why not just capitalize on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Might as well build on a successful brand when you can. Exactly. So, Trevor, are we seeing any positive signs of a turnaround for the Lethbridge and District Exhibition Agri-Food Hub and Trade Center? It's such a long name now. Yeah, yeah so the Agri-Food the Agri Hub and Trade Center, uh, there was an update provided to Lethbridge City Council on Tuesday, September the 17th, actually. And so far this year, the Agri-Food Hub has hosted about 240 events and they've got another 25 to go balance of year. So that's good. We're seeing some increased activity there. Uh, there was a, a there's a deficit forecasted at the end of the year of about 3.3 million, but that's an improvement over the previous forecast of 4.7. So yes, it's still a deficit, but certainly about, you know, just about $1.4 million better than they had originally forecasted. And your viewers may remember that at the beginning of the year, that deficit was almost double that was forecasted to be closer to 6 million. So Certainly, we've seen some big progress. They're focused on cutting their costs over there, hosting more events and driving revenues. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed, we'll see that the, they can continue to turn that around into next year. Yeah, there were a lot of challenges there, but it does look like they are, you know, sort of trying to turn that around. So good on them, definitely. So, uh, Trevor, what are you hearing from the construction industry? You mentioned uh, some big projects happening. Mm hmm. Yeah, those big projects like McCain and New Cold are certainly driving uh, the major project side. We've had renovations at the Chinook Regional Hospital. So there's a number of institutional projects, a new school on the west side of Lethbridge, for example, driving the sector. Um, the other thing that we've seen gain is also on residential construction. So housing starts are actually up compared to last year and up about 8% over the five-year average. So looking back, you know, housing starts are up, which is good. We need more housing. But that also in turn drives a significant chunk of the construction industry. So again, all indications there are quite positive, uh, especially after a few years of declines and massive spikes in costs. We're starting to see that come back around. Okay. Uh, what about real estate? Are we seeing any changes in the real estate market now with interest rates on the decline and some easing on mortgage rules? Yeah, great question. I mean, the interest rates, of course, the, the changes have been fairly recent, so the impacts probably won't be seen for a few more months. Uh, but the expectation, I guess the good news coming out of that is there is an expectation interest rates will continue to come down, especially if that sort of drop in inflation holds. So in Lethbridge, we've seen housing prices increase about 19% this year compared to last year, big jump. The average price of a home across all categories in Lethbridge was about $391,000. So again, if you're selling, that's good news. The market is up. But that's still very affordable when you think about Calgary at an average price of about $563,000. There's still a big Absolutely, difference there. Absolutely, yeah. When we look at sales, there's been about 195 transactions year-to-date in Lethbridge on housing resales, and that's about 10% higher than last year. So even the number of transactions has improved. There's more activity at a higher price point. And you know, in the foreseeable future, although there's more housing starts, it's nowhere near what we need to supply the market. Population is growing way faster than the housing market. So I, I fully expect to continue to see that upward pressure. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on where Lethbridge is headed, economically speaking, over the next six months, Trevor? 
Yeah, I think overall it's good news. Everything we've talked about so far, there are many positive things that we should be excited about. You know, I'm not too concerned about the short-term forecast. Uh, one thing we do need to be mindful of, though, is the brewing dispute between Canada and China over canola. So, you know, the Government of Canada recently announced uh, an increase in tariffs on electric vehicles and electric batteries from China, 100% tariff. So China's undertaken a review, in quotation marks, of uh, our exports and our practices with canola. And I think it's important for people to realize that Canada is the largest shipper of canola in the world, and China is the largest importer. And a good chunk of that affects the local economy here. Canola is a big crop in southern Alberta. So depending where that goes, uh, we, there could be some major concerns in the market next year. Okay, well, we've talked about construction and ag and real estate. Uh, we touched a little bit on manufacturing a little bit earlier, but what is the latest from the manufacturing sector? How are things shaping up there, Trevor? Yeah, we've seen very strong growth in, in Lethbridge exports as a measure of our manufacturing sector. So last year, 2023, exports grew about 3% to $2.2 billion. And most of that, like I said, is manufactured goods. We've also seen very significant employment gains. So if we look at employment in 2019, sort of pre-pandemic to now, the manufacturing sector in our community has grown by 2,600 jobs. So, you know, close to 3,000 positions added in manufacturing. I think, you know, just going forward, the one potential risk is the U.S. election in November. Uh, regardless of who wins and who's in the Oval Office, both presidential candidates are very protectionist. And we could see some challenges to the exports that we produce and their access to the U.S. market. So that'll be something we'll keep a close eye on going into the fall. Yeah. What is our biggest, uh, what, what's the biggest item that we are manufacturing and exporting out besides canola, <laughs> like you mentioned? Finished food products. So, you know, actually packaged consumer goods is the number one category for sure. But Lethbridge produces everything from jet engines uh, to, you know, aluminum extruded windows and doors uh, all the way through to modular structures and, uh, you know, heavy equipment and trailers. So Lethbridge has a very diverse manufacturing sector and not a lot of people realize all the great things that come out of here. Seriously. No, thanks so much for your insight there, Trevor. And thanks so much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on the show again. Take care. You as well. Trevor Lewington is the CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.